Well, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for joining us for, for today's session. Um, so again, my name is Alex Abood. I work for CMHA Edmonton, and I'm pleased to be the host for today's session on supporting your, your neighbor's mental health. Uh, to begin, uh, we acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional meeting grounds, gathering place, and traveling route to the Cree, Salto, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene, and Nakota Sioux. We acknowledge all the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. We also want to acknowledge that today is the National Day of Awareness for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls, um, and today is meant to be a call to action. But we must also take the time to remember those we have lost and give the families and survivors a voice. And remember that we all have a role in fighting against these injustices. And uh, you will note that some of us are wearing red, th those of us who got the notice in time. Um, and I thank my colleague Beth for, for noting that on today, the um, people are encouraged to wear red um, in support and to raise awareness for, for this issue. So to begin our program, just wanna mention a bit about Mental Health Week and thank you for joining. Now in its 70th year, uh, CMHA Mental Health Week is marked across the country and aims to raise awareness about mental health concerns in our community and to power, empower all of us to do more. We hope you'll join us th throughout the rest of the week for these sessions. Tomorrow at lunch, we have a panel on men's and boys suicide prevention. And on Friday, a conversation with the Alberta Esports Association about esports and mental health. For today's session, you should see a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Please submit any questions you have there and we'll get through as many of them as we can. There may be sensitive content that comes up and which could be triggering. Um, and if there is, and if you need any, any support at any time, please call our 24 seven distress line at 780-482-4357. Now to begin, I would like to introduce our two panelists and speakers today. Uh, we're pleased to have both of them uh, spending some time with us. Laura Cunningham Spelly is the Executive Director of the Edmonton Federation of Community Leagues. Laura has been involved in her community league since 2009 when she became involved when her daughter was a baby. As a registered social worker, she has had several jobs over these past 13 years, including running a licensed day home in her community, working with First Nations living on reserve in public health programming, and now as executive director of EFCL. Through these years, she has always been involved in the league and this associational life provided her opportunity to be involved in community engagement alongside incredible people. During the pandemic, Laura has seen how leagues as community-based organizations have responded and provided continued connection and engagement across the city. Howard Lawrence is the Abundant Community Edmonton Coordinator. Howard has consulted on neighborhood health across North America. He is a co-founder of the Abundant Community Initiative with John McKnight and Peter Block. Howard has a passion for strong neighborhood leadership and continues to work collaboratively to find ways to enable people to build neighborly relationships and increase their local collective capacity. So welcome, to, uh, welcome Howard and welcome Laura. Now to start, um, let's, uh, yeah, let's just, so we're like 14 months or so into this. Um, what are you seeing in your work, like at the community level? How are, like, tell us about, a bit about your organizations, maybe what you're, what's been new, how you've been responding to the pandem pandemic, and then what you're hearing and what you're seeing, like on the ground level. Sure, yeah, thanks. Great to be here and great to be alongside Laura. So, of course, I uh, work with the city of Edmonton. So at a broad level, the pandemic has had a tremendous impact. In our section, which is the neighborhood section, um, uh, well, uh, Slate Magazine called uh, 2020 the year of the neighborhood. So in many respects, we have been called upon to innovate and create uh, new frameworks for people to connect with their neighbors. And, um, yeah, so our, our role in the neighborhood section is to develop and maintain neighborhood infrastructure. So our section uh, cares about everything 
like physical infrastructure from from parks to to uh, various other physical elements in the neighborhood, halls, retail, all of those things are, you know, in physical infrastructure that we care about. But I think today, and maybe more importantly for us, we also pay close attention to social infrastructure, kind of that softer element of life together in the neighborhood, everything from play streets to block parties to groups in the neighborhood to how agencies engage uh, with residents in neighborhoods. So in all of those spaces, I guess a stay at home order that we have heard is also a stay in the neighborhood order. And so because of that, um, you know, we've been, able, be, we've been wanting to facilitate uh, better relationships in that, in that place in the neighborhood. Yeah, I think that's such a good point, Howard. I don't think there's ever been a time where we have valued our public spaces and our neighborhood spaces as much as we have this past year. So just from, you know, knowing where the green spaces are, where we can run a dog or run a kid or run ourselves to blow off some steam, I think, you know, we've really realized that these spaces are so precious. And I think, you know, EFCL has recognized the role that those leagues play in, in really keeping those spaces and holding those spaces as public public places, right? Leagues are in, there's 162 of them across the city and the EFCL has been trying to support them to support ways that they can engage the neighborhood through this. And, you know, leagues tend to be uh, folks who wanna gather people. I think we all are just craving that opportunity to gather together in physical ways, you know, through events or socials or eating together, you know, and I think this has been a real challenge this year. And so I think, you know, we're, we're reimagining our neighborhoods. We're looking at those blocks in different ways. We're looking at, you know, oh, did the neighbor put the, are the blinds up or the blinds down? Are they doing okay? You know, I think we're all just much more aware of all of that this year than we ever have been before. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. I, think, I think of Jane Jacobs and her, uh, notion that the um, sidewalks are the hallways of the neighborhood and sometimes it's just nice to get out on the sidewalks and I think I've seen so many times when uh, people are just out for a walk maybe it's at maybe it's at lunchtime or maybe it's a coffee break really uh, I and I you know you just wander out I wander out and yep. I love it that uh, people are wanting to chat so they'll maintain mm distance and gather around and I've been in conversations where I'm, I'm walking and and uh, and I've heard this boast from many people it takes a long time to go anywhere because there's so many chats along the way <laughs> and, uh, uh, and people gather together and oftentimes introductions are made on the sidewalk introducing new neighbors to one another and uh, you know it's it's been amazing to uh, maybe for some people to engage neighbors really for the first time, but for many of us to renew acquaintances with neighbors that we've known in the past and maybe connect in with them. So it's been uh, amazing. And, and I think we've anticipated that this was going to be a tough time uh, mm -hmm. for many individuals. And, uh, you know, on the other side or on the 21, 2021 side of 2020, mm -hmm. um, I think we've been amazed to see and the reports are starting to come out that there's indications that people have actually done pretty well. And mm -hmm. in some cases flourished. I know the CDC in the US has experienced a 6% decrease in suicides. This is what mm -hmm. they're reporting, which is unbelievable, right? And uh, I know a CBC, not CDC, a CBC article out of Saskatoon talked about a decline, uh, uh, a decline that they haven't seen for 20 years in suicide rates there. And in that conversation, she points to something called the get together effect. And uh, I think from disaster sociology, we might have been able to anticipate that this kind of environment actually causes people to get their perspectives quite right. And, you know, think about life deeply instead of, um, well, and then also, I'll, I'll say a word about that in a second, and also to connect with people in a way that they haven't because it matters. Uh, in that same book, I was gonna say, she says of disasters, and I wonder if the pandemic has had a similar effect. She says, that's Rebecca Solon. And she says, disasters are the event that save us from the disaster that is every day. And I think that 
in some ways, this new life where you're settled, you're home, you know, things, some things have been stripped away. My, you know, my son lost his job because of the pandemic. And it's caused us to turn toward relationships and turn toward those things that matter. And I think that, you know, that's been an enriching experience for many. Now, if you don't have relationships at the neighborhood level, this is going to leave you in a substantially uh, deficient position. And, and hopefully we'll talk about that as well. Yeah, and I think that's a good point, Howard, because I think while I in some ways I think we have seen greater engagement on the block level, I think in some ways we've seen um, you know, people being worried, right? So instead of, we don't pass each other on the sidewalk anymore, we go around, you know, we, we switch sides of the road because we're worried, we don't wanna to be too close. And so I think there are two sides to this. And I think that that's why there's, it's been so important to have different ways of engaging people because some people just won't respond one-on-one. -on -one. That's too worrying right now. They're, they're concerned about the pandemic, they're concerned about their health. Um, and so I think, you know, we've seen that important role that the virtual realm has been able to play on connecting people, right? That people have connected. So we've seen, you know, some of the apps, you know, Nextdoor or Facebook, you know, all the social media has really exploded and for better or for worse at times, right? I would, I would say that some of us have realized we have to retreat a bit um, because it has been really difficult. But I think, you know, what I've seen League's been able to do is, is to hold those virtual workshops, like much like we're doing today and have these conversations in ways where people can feel safe and can still connect, but in a way where, that they're comfortable in their own home. Um, and so it's, it's, I think it's been really interesting for, for me at the UFCL to watch how League's have tried to respond. So not only still trying to do those, you know, you know, walkabouts where people put up things in their windows or scavenger hunts, and but also the, the virtual pub nights, the online trivia games, you know, those sort of things also, I think, have really shown us what we're capable of and shown us that we can keep connected um, in ways that we feel safest, for sure. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. I think mm -hmm. something that was just serendipitous is that nextdoor.com, which is a kind of a Facebook for neighborhoods, entered Canada in 2020 yeah so, it's amazing yep uh so they've seen an incredible growth uh of nextdoor.com uh participation so in some neighborhoods in edmonton we're up over 40 percent of people are participating on this and maybe some of you don't know about this but it's uh, it's uh, highly it's a democratized uh, app where everybody gets a voice in this space and uh, yet it's moderated by leadership that comes from within the neighborhood so uh, it's been helpful to many, uh, I think, to connect up with life that goes on in the neighborhood and various groups forming within the neighborhood through the app has been, uh, been pretty cool. You know, I wanted to comment too, you, you know, Laura, you mentioned, you know, it hasn't been easy for, for lots of people and certainly I don't want to underplay that. I know that um, Angus Reid did a poll and I was shocked by the, the, the way they framed the statistic that 35% of Canadians are, when it comes to engagement with others, feel desolate. And I think that that kind of language says that we have a lot of work in this space of social infrastructure or building social capital. How do we build connections between people in, you know, encouraging relationships? And particularly in the pandemic, when families, and friends um, are by necessity oftentimes isolated from us um, as valuable. And, and we talk about relational nutrients. Obviously, family is an important relational nutrient, and friends bring us so much to our lives. But it, this is a time for that uh, neighboring relational nutrient to kick in. And it's one that oftentimes we don't think about. And I know in 2020, there's been more conversation about the research that Mark Granover did around weak ties. It's those relationships that maybe you don't even know the person's name uh, in neighborhoods. You don't need to, right? You just well, you share no, space, you, you, you share the fence. Dog's name. <laughs> you do the oh, dog's name. The dog, uh, uh, <laughs> but, and that, that yeah. those relationships are so yeah. valuable. They enrich us so mm -hmm. much. Uh, we've been talking about that those relationships being a social snack, a healthy snack. Mm -hmm. And they're, and they're part of your day, right? So you're walking your kids to school, you're walking the dog, and you just happen to see them and you don't, and there's no expectation to have a full on conversation, although 
folks like you and I, Howard, might insist on that because that's how we roll, but, but there's no need to. And so I think you're right, though, it's being recognized, feeling that sense of belonging, feeling that sense of I, I am part of this block, I am part of this neighborhood, I know this person, whether I know their name, like you said, or I just know the vehicle they drive, and I know where they like to park, you know, those are all pieces that help us to feel connected. And I think that's what we've realized, right, through all of this is that, that sense of belonging, that sense of connection is really what we're all actually really needing through this pandemic. We know that, you know, some of us are just hanging on, right, we're just holding on by a thread, some days are better than others. But, but that sense of belonging is, is what you know, I wonder, Howard, if, if we will see the the discrepancy, you know, the, those of us with rich, rich in relationships and those of us with really poor relationships, as you mentioned, those folks that feel desolate, if that divide will be greater. And so how do we how do we help fill in 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 the middle? Right. How do we help to ensure that that both sides are strong, but also the middle is stronger. Right. So that it's not just extremities yeah it's good and even using that language of the middle because the middle relationships again point to granover's research in terms of weak ties and another guy mark dunkelman talks about how that we have these you know in our society we've really focused on those primary relationships at the center our family generally speaking and our friends and they're quite limited in number and then through social media there's these extreme relationships that are hyper affinity or face based, you know, uh, kind of um, affinity based. And so we'll yep. become friends with th that level, but there's this whole middle section. He And he actually calls it the middle relationship mm -hmm. and the middle ring. And I think that the strength of that uh, through this time, and I think for us, we would wanna say, um, and there's, there's this notion of social prescribing. If I were to prescribe something right now for our mental health, I would prescribe mm. weak tie relationships that are found in the neighborhood. They're right. so enriching in multiple ways. They're enriching yeah. in the diversity that you'll discover. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people different from you. So you're going to enjoy that. The accessibility of those individuals, they live right close to you. The frequency of those relationships, like you can see them every day, like that's right yeah and you know so it's it's a really uh, wonderful mm -hmm. relationship to be prescribed for uh yeah. you know our mental health yeah no i would agree absolutely yeah absolutely. So, so howard and laura one of the things you touched on is just the difficulty of you know some of the those normal in-person interactions you get with neighbors um which you know with distancing with people being out less um, we uh, don't, you know, we don't get those informal interactions in the same way. Um, how, what, what might be a substitute for that? Like, how do you check in or even like, like if you've, as you know, anyone follows the housing market knows lots of Edmontonians are moving now. So we have new neighbors, um, you know, either selves or have moved in on our blocks. Like, how do we make those connections where you know, we might not make them naturally in the same way, um, you know, these days. Yeah, I mean, I always think springtime is a great time because especially as homeowners, right? And I think that's an important thing to bring up is I think we have different experiences depending on the, the type of housing we live in. And I think we need to really be aware of that. But homeowners tend to be out this time of year, right? We're prepping the lawn. And so I think to Howard's point, it's about how do you just give the wave? How do you just, you know, acknowledge someone's presence and, and whether maybe you don't feel comfortable to go over and have a conversation but I think it's about acknowledging that you belong here we recognize you're new you know nice to see you. we're in weird times we might not feel like we can get too close or have a chat but it's that acknowledgement you know I think it is more challenging for folks that are in condos and in, in apartment buildings how how they connect right and I think there's been a lot of conversation about how we can you know, support new developments going forward around how to have those more cohesive spaces where people can connect and, and, and the community can connect. I still think we're stuck with a lot of buildings that are really difficult. And so I think that it's always important to to think about the things like the, the flyers or, you know, someone was saying last night we were in a meeting they made cookies and and gave them you know gave a little bag of cookies to each neighbor and just you know put a little name on it said you know this is my gift from you know joe in in uh, unit 300 right and so i think it's sort of just again finding ways that are innovative that feel safe that feel safe especially during this time but um that acknowledgement of person that acknowledgement of place i think is it goes a long way 
goes a long way. Absolutely. I think I, I know that the regular spaces of life that we don't dwell in that much, you know, our back, you know, our back alley, the cul-de-sac center, the sidewalks, those places can be fertile ground for, uh, you know, as Laura said, just a wave. And, uh, the, you know, in, in the neighboring relationship, there's kind of two ideas. One is ambient neighboring. So there's this idea of just what does a wave do to a, another human being, an acknowledgement and a smile. And so because of the frequency of our relationships with our neighbors, particularly those that are on the same block or cul-de-sac or building floor, repetitive waves or smiles over time create a vibe, a neighborly friendly vibe, which just actually allows us to have oxy, you know, it produces oxytocin, good, good stuff in our, in our, in our being. And, um, um, and those lead to manifest neighboring. You know, we'll actually say, how are you doing? Is there any way I can help? Would you like a hand at, or, you know, any of those things. And I think that it's a, it's a little thing, a smile or a wave, but in reality, because of its frequency in our lives, those everyday connections with the neighbors actually produce a lot of well-being for us and then can actually manifest in direct connection. And it's not only the asking for help that is um, that creates human well-being and flourishing, but it's also actually the providing help. It feels as good to give help as it does to receive help, uh, you know, from in relationship or particularly from neighbors. So, uh, you know, I think just persist on getting outside, smiling, waving, and as you're comfortable engaging in, you know, a brief to whatever length conversations you can over time. Yeah. And noticing the folks that can't get out, right? Recognizing, you know, I have a neighbor next door who, who can't get out, right? She's older and isn't able to. And I think it's also, you know, about recognizing those folks on your neighborhood, on your block, in your community. You know, how can you, you know, can you drop something off? Can you put a note in the mailbox? Those sort of things that, again, just acknowledge that you're here. If they need a hand, you know, phone numbers, um, those sort of things are always really helpful. Yeah, I think that's mm -hmm. that you know, even, um, you know, we've been asked both by Alberta Emergency Management, but also AHS to have a plan that involves our neighbors. And so uh, one conversation that might be challenging, but it's important on both of those fronts are, hi, I'm your neighbor. Both a uh, Alberta Emergency Management and Alberta Health have said that we should have a plan together Here's my phone number and my email. If you'd like to call me, please call me. And if you'd like to, you know, contribute yours to our block list, you know, that would be um, that would be helpful as well. Um, you know, that goes a long way, not just during the pandemic, but residually over time. Once we've shared that kind of intimate detail of our life, our phone number, which is the white pages of past, um, once we have that little list on our fridge. <laughs> Uh, it, it does build a sense of community and a sense of belonging yeah. that's just helpful to us. Yeah, move your car. They're coming with the street cleaners. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, those sort of things. They can be helpful, right? It can be helpful to connect with others in so many different ways, different circumstances. Absolutely. All of that everyday life stuff. It's yeah, great. yeah. That's well, right. and I think even, you know, one example, too, is the psychological benefits. I know I, I live in a mature neighborhood in central Edmonton, and like a lot of them, you know, we do get wave, waves going through of, you know, petty crime, for example, in the alleys, yeah. garage break-ins, car break-ins, and simply, know, you know, one of the things, you know, pre-pandemic times mm. when I would travel, knowing my, my neighbors and being able to say, by the way, like, if you see a guy who looks like me, that's my brother checking in on the house. But <laughs> if you see anybody else, like, that's suspicious, and like, please keep an eye out, and just knowing, you know, knowing people, you can ask people like that, or I know on my block, we're a mix of, you know, longer term residents and some, you know, some rental houses where there's, you know, frequent turnover, but mm -hmm. being able to help knowing, you know, who's, if someone's away helping to shovel snow and, um, you know, and even just, or and with some of our elder, elderly neighbors as well. So I think, you know, that's, you know, for me as, as a, as a community member, that's been one of the kind of intangible, tangible, but also intangible benefits of, mm -hmm. you know, getting to know neighbors a little bit. Um, 
couple of, I just want to interject just to remind um, attendees to use the Q&A function. Um, I am, we have disabled the chat. Please don't look at it. There was an inappropriate comment shared and I want to apologize for that, Laura, and to all of the attendees who saw that um, the person left not long after before we would have removed him, removed him from the conversation. So I, on behalf of uh, CMHA, I want to apologize for that. That was inappropriate and no one should receive a comment like that. Thank you, Alex. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, it kind of it brings to mind um, social media. And um, I think learning again how to talk face to face, you know, where the sphere of our influence is felt personally, right? When we actually have an influence over someone that we're in proximity to them. And so that has a very positive side. When I think about uh, care, I don't think in abstraction. It's like, Laura, I think about my neighbor next door. When I make a comment, I don't comment into abstraction. I'm commenting into a relationship that I have long-term accountability for. And so I think on the other side of 2020, the strengthening of the neighboring relationship will really be good for our human soul. We will become more human as we interact with people who, you know, may be different than us, have different opinions than us, but ultimately we see them as human beings making a life together in these common spaces called our neighborhoods. So, you know, I think there's, there's, there's some good things that are coming. Um, and I think we're going to hold on to those as well. I think we're learning that maybe, you know, even the notes and Alex, you mentioned, you know, helping neighbors. How, in the past we have, you know, I guess currently we think about random acts of kindness. Mm -hmm. I think now we're seeing with the pandemic, the seriousness of being kind to one another and that we can't leave it to random acts. We actually have to have intentional, organized acts of kindness mm. so that everyone is included, that no one is left out. And certainly, again, on your blog, well, within family, don't leave anybody out. But the nature of friendship is that some people are going to be excluded if they don't play on your volleyball team anymore or have left town. But certainly, neighborhoods are inclusive. Let's not leave anybody out. Mm -hmm. Let's check in on everyone on our block. Mm -hmm. to make sure that you know that we're covered off in terms of our well-being and the block is the perfect um framework for inclusion let's mm -hmm. not get anybody out even you know and i i think we talk about yeah i was gonna say even if you don't really get along with them or see eye to eye with your neighbor right. um right. that's kind of similar to your family mm -hmm. you don't see mm -hmm. eye to eye with uncle bob <laughs> you know and there's some people that you just don't get along with in your family well neighbors are sort of similar Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean we exclude them. Mm -hmm. We include them in our care. And all of us benefit from that kind of inclusion. So, you know, I think, I think we're going to learn some things during this, this, these, this pandemic time. Yeah, and I, I, I agree, Howard. Absolutely. I think we have to learn that face-to-face -face relationship is, has been a bit of a lost art for sure. Um, but I do think, you know, the reality is that sometimes neighbors don't get along and that can be really challenging and so I think it's it's again like you said even though there might be you know rifts on the block or rifts in the neighborhood you know always ensuring that people know that there's a place that they can go or know who they can contact if they're in trouble doesn't mean you have to be friends we all know that you might not be friends um, but you share space and, and you share a common place right and so Alex you know I think as our neighborhoods turn over you talked about the mature neighborhoods that you live in I mean neighborhoods do and and that's a beauty of some of our more mature neighborhoods in, in Edmonton I would say all of our neighborhoods is that you have that wide demographic of people that live there and and that brings such wealth and that brings some challenges right and so I think you know, I look at our community league boards across the city and and that can be the challenge of, of getting involved. You know, once you've kind of connected with your neighbors, often people say, well, let's, you know, we want to make a change. We want to see something happen. And so that's the, the beautiful part about Edmonton where you can you can together make something happen through the league movement. You can go to your board of your league and say, we want to try this. We want to get a stop sign put here. We, you know, we're interested in having a street party here or a whole day of street parties. You know, the, the league is perfect at sort of mobilizing a large area 
area of people in a common way. And so I think, you know, as we as we move forward, we're going to see the importance of, of leagues. And I think as people want to do new things and their place becomes more special to them, their neighborhood becomes more special, they will, you know, find ways to kind of connect and, and move through that, that movement. But for some folks, it's always going to be the block. They just, the, you know, they're not interested in that organized space. But I think we're fortunate here in Edmonton that we have both and that both are so strong that people can have those engaging relationships on the block. They can also engage on a, on a wider wider front so to speak and they can mobilize move those issues further if they're interested so it, it'll now, be an interesting 2021 absolutely it, it will be yeah <laughs> uh, now on that i mean in terms of connecting you know i think a lot of the standard ways i mean especially if there's a delay or cancellation of you know the spring sports uh where i know a lot of that's how a lot of you know families in the same neighborhoods connect for example uh, over the last year, like, are there, you know, in, in your work, have you come across any kind of, you know, creative ways that, or whether it's programs or activities that, uh, that neighbors have done, um, you know, to stay connected? Um, you know, I can think, not in, in my neighborhood, but where, where my parents live in South Edmonton, um, one of the neighbors uh, had arranged and started, I don't know if it was a neighbor, the league started bringing in a food truck uh, once a week last summer, and they would distributed flyers. They say, contact this person, like, you know, it's all pre-ordered, but that was a way that, you know, people got out and, you know, my parents are seniors. They do get out, they're active, you know, in like a lot of seniors, they're active in their yards. They garden a lot, but, you know, they don't, weren't, didn't see as many neighbors face to face. And they said, that was just a nice way to like get out and, uh, and see some people they hadn't seen in a while, like whether they knew them well or not. So. Yeah, yeah, I was just wondering if you've seen anything creative like that or otherwise that leaks have done or block connected. Howard and I should write a book. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's almost been hard to keep up, to be honest, Alex. I feel like I'm continuously inspired by what people come up with and different initiatives that they come up with, you know, from, you know, we talked a little bit about scavenger hunts, but lots of Jane's walks and connecting with different um different ages of people throughout the neighborhood to bring history back into being you know art expressions of art I think have been really important hey Howard through this time just people really using different mediums and I just noticed in the Q&A someone mentioned about the the strange relationships and I think it's important to mention because I think we touched on it a bit but you know I joke about the street cleaner and you know it might be funny to me that I forgot to move my vehicle but for someone else that's you know really you know, really an annoying and really frustrating that, you know, I didn't see the notice and I didn't move my vehicle. And so, you know, it's, I don't know if I have any sort of concrete suggestions other than to say, you know, it's, it's about acknowledgement. It's acknowledging that person's feelings and, and, and moving on. You will, we will never be perfect neighbors. We all try our best. Absolutely. Um, but I think all of us are feeling stress. You know, I, I live in under a thousand square feet and I will have four of us uh, here as of next week, all working from home. And so, yes, my backyard is loud in the evening because I push my children out the door and say, don't come back. And so I think, you know, we will, our, our blocks are going to be louder, especially this time. I think um, in the spring, people will be out more and so it's going to be a challenge, I think. And I think that's, it's wise to bring up and good to acknowledge. You know, I just further to that too. I think one of the ways that's been helpful for me um, is to think about the, the neighboring relationship as unlike the friendship relationship. And it's a, it's a unique kind of relationship, just like I mentioned before, family is a unique kind of relationship. So, and in many ways, um, the neighboring relationship, while it's wonderful to have friends in the neighborhood, which really means I share affinity with people. We have the same age kids. We have the same, we love to play the same sports. So I can have friends in the neighborhood, but generally speaking, the neighboring relationship's a little bit more like the family relationship. It's diverse. It goes through various stages. It's quite enduring. It goes on and on and on with the people that you're around and you may not see eye to eye in every space, just like family. And, but, and, and does, again, disaster sociology shows us that just like family, even though we may not get along with everybody in our family, as they say, when the chips are down, we will be there for one another. 
And the, you know, the subtitle of the book that uh, Rebecca Solent writes is um, Par uh, Disaster Sociology, Paradise Made in Hell. And so the idea is that actually when the chips are down and we really see each other for the human beings, for the humanity that we are, we actually connect at that level and it is a rich connection. And so certainly these little irritants come up, but ultimately when we can over time see people in their humanity and, you know, Laura, I think you're long-term resident just as I am 35 years. I've had some residents that I've had some wrinkled relationship with, you know, kind of a awkward time. And now what I'm thinking of particularly, I'm in a caregiving role to that individual. And so they, it, life moves on. And um, it's a great environment for our own formation as we learn mm -hmm. to deal with that, those kinds of conflicts and creative challenges that, uh, you know, dealing with challenges in a creative way are, are you know, are there, so. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. One uh, of our attendees just asked, can you repeat the, the name of the, the author you just mentioned? So that is Paradise Made in Hell by Rebecca Solent, Communities Built in Disaster. Uh, it's such a good read. Um, I wanna just mention a, a fun thing that I saw in, in, in one of the blocks in my own neighborhood. Um, during the pandemic, it's hard to keep kids apart. And so these families decided on the block to uh, have an agreement around um, engagement. And so they be, the kids named this, their, their connection together. They did school together. They called it the, the bubble of awesome. And they have been in relationship and a safe relationship with one another, which I don't think, well, it, it's obvious that just wouldn't have happened had it, it, it not been these particular times in as much as they felt like they were in a second layer family that was secure and safe for them. So uh, I, I've appreciated that story, but and the art, I think we've seen a lot of sidewalk chalk art mm -hmm. and uh, all kinds of uh, manners of, of connecting together, but money up most of them, I think, and it's not to downplay this, are the mundane small gatherings. I think there's nothing more richer mm. for participants. And again, I'm talking about those circles that mm -hmm. stand on the street in the sidewalk or the park chatting. And uh, then during you know, other times of, of our mm -hmm. uh, pandemic when the, the restrictions are different, they can actually have small gatherings. You know, Now we're down to five, but gatherings of 10 in the back alley, yep. and maybe even as a block social. And mm -hmm. again, we underplay the value of the block social. It's just a block social. And sometimes I would say, well, we underplay the value of a thanks of a holiday dinner as well. Yeah. Just a turkey. Mm -hmm. But no, it's super valuable for those relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think it brings connection. Yeah, for sure. I'm oh, sorry, Alex, go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, I just did want to mention too to, the, to the, the question a little while back too about if there's heightened tension. I mean, everyone's, as you said, everyone's feeling stressed. And I think it, it's unfortunate, but you shouldn't like it's may not be personal. Uh, but that's just, you know, where a lot of us are at uh, right now after a year of this, you know, stress of whether it's work stress, family stress of having, you know, kids sent home from school that you might as a neighbor just be the, unfortunate outlet uh, because you didn't clean up your, uh, you haven't cleaned up your leaves and your, you know, yard refuse from over the winter. So um, yeah, or just, you know, if, you know, parking is one of those things in my experience that always creates tension. So I, I think it's just, you know, giving people, you know, cutting people a bit of slack that we're all a little bit extra stressed right now, whether we re are conscious of it or not. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, sorry, mm -hmm. no, go no, go ahead, Howard, it's fine. I want to say too, mm -hmm. that again, the intentional acts of kindness are important. Mm -hmm. So that we build a, we need to build a bridge of relationship in advance of the heavy freight we have to walk over it right? Mm -hmm. There will always be heavy freight in relationships. And certainly all of these, you know, street cleaning, leaves raking, oh, so many things. It's the heavy freight of relationship. 
building a bridge in advance by having a block social, let's just say. Mm -hmm. It's pretty hard to be rudely mad at your neighbor after you've had a glass of wine or a cup of coffee with them. Yeah. So we want to continue to build those bridges of relationship with those around us so that when difficult times come, we can get over it. And the difficult times aren't just those things that irritate us, mm -hmm. but there will be life and death and grief and all and mental illness and all so many things on our block mm -hmm. that will be necessarily present too. So let's build those relationships so that we can be supportive. Down through history and across cultures, the neighborhood, the village, the block has been a supportive social relationship. Mm -hmm. Who are we to think that we can live without that valuable social mm -hmm. support? We can't. So let's be building it proactively. That's right. Yeah, and let's um, be intentional we, about it. We have a few minutes left. I just wanna uh, flag that if there's any more questions from the from attendees, uh, now would be a good time to get them in. Um, so I have a, a couple questions myself while we wait to see if um, there's any last qu uh, attendee questions. Um, I mean, so the patterns have changed. I mean, you might see your neighbors more or you might less, you see them less, you know, depending on their schedule. If you, if, you know, you used to often see them if you'd take the bus together or, uh, or you know, or leave, at the, leave or come home at the same time. Are there some signs you can think of, you know, if a neighbor's struggling, you know, what might you look for? Like, would there be like a, like anything you might be able to observe, say from a street level, like if you don't get to interact with them and just anything, you know, if, if you, you have a neighbor, it just, you don't need someone to reach out or needs a bit of support. Yeah. How, is, is there any signs you might, you might be able to look for? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, yeah, there's, I, I mean, it comes to mind that the, if you're paying attention because other human beings live, to, live around you, you'll notice small things. It's, it's an organic, natural relationship. So you're going to notice, um, are the lights on in their house at the appropriate times or is the light never coming on? Is the blinds uh, always down are they not open we're not opening those blinds yeah for sure. so it's this it's this mm -hmm. paying attention it's uh, having an allowing yourself to have an emotional investment to mm -hmm. the human beings that live in proximity to you so this again will be generally speaking your block although i think in a healthy and a healing neighborhood not only are blocks connected in an emotional way and it's odd because there's there's uh you know proximal closeness, but there's also a level of emotional closeness that is historically been there, you know, can I borrow a cup of sugar kind of closeness. Um, but then there's also, I think, in a healing neighborhood, groups that form in the neighborhood, the new moms group, there would be the teen group, there will be the seniors group. And again, when groups are networked, and it may be social media networked, or they may be physically networked, when someone's silent or absent those are key signs that you should probably check in mm -hmm. like any other friend except for these friends are local friends and we shouldn't be afraid to check in right Howard I think sometimes we feel like we shouldn't bother them or you know they've just got stuff going on we should just stay out of it but I think I think it is it's about that just that little tap it doesn't need to be a big thing it's the wave it's the text message it's the how's it going because I, I, I don't think I don't think anyone's expecting us to be a therapist and to jump in and to, and to solve problems. And what we know now more than ever is that it's those natural supports that Howard has spoken so well about that are really what, what build us up and what keep us going through these difficult times. And, and it's often not our professional supports, but our natural supports that we really rely on. So never be afraid to reach out, never be afraid to just touch base and, you know, if you haven't seen the wind, the blinds go up in the neighbor's house for, you know, a few days, give a knock on the door just say hey everything okay good see ya you know that's all it needs to be right but I think it's it's acknowledging that you've noticed and I think Alex it's such a good point you bring up because we you know especially now we're all home we notice these things and we should be paying attention because it, it those are the signs that are the signs of bigger issues right so we can we can be might be that first person to check in that first person to reach out yeah, I'm just further to that, Laura, I think there's a really important insight there. You, you mentioned 
we feel like we're intruding or interrupting. Mm -hmm. Now, yep. that is the nature of the neighboring relationship because privacy is so essential to the neighboring relationship. We're so conscious of privacy that we're afraid to interrupt. Yep. And we're afraid to intrude. We're both with both friends and family that really doesn't exist. We don't mind interrupting a friend. We don't mind intruding on a friend or family, but the neighboring relationship, this notion of intrusion or mm -hmm. interrupting is big. So mm -hmm. let's get over it. Let's, yeah. you know, we need to have responsible levels of privacy, mm -hmm. but let's, let's lower privacy. Let's interrupt more because people want to be invited. They want to be looked in on. Hey, like Laura said, let's interrupt let's mm -hmm. let's go for it with our neighbors and just say how are you that's right absolutely <laughs> um i have a, a quick question just to wrap up um from each of you laura and howard so one th what's one thing each of us on the call can do um like let's say in the next week, whether it's an action one-on-one -on -one with a neighbor or more at you know the macro neighborhood block or neighborhood level, but just one thing, one simple thing each of everyone can do to be you know to support our neighbors in the next week. Laura, I was gonna say Howard. Oh, it's a, it's a big question, well, Alex, and I, I think know. yeah. Go ahead. You know where I could go. Again, it's back to the in, in taking the random acts of kindness and making them intentional. Please, if you're not the one, find somebody on your block who can be the point person for your block. Yeah, and that that would simply be someone who is willing, and maybe maybe two of you can do it get a phone list together on your block that can mm -hmm. that can check in and also through that phone list you can extend an invitation and the one of the invitations should be maybe it's maybe it'll be when when we get permission to lower all the barriers post covid have a party on your block build the bridge of relationship soon so that would be mine find someone who would say we're not going to be random anymore on our block we're going to be intentional we, me, or we too are going to take some leadership on our block to pull us together. And I, I would go even simpler than that, Howard. I would say just move your deck chairs to the front lawn. <laughs> because I think too often we sit in the back and we enjoy the sunshine and really we just need to be out front. And I think this is a hard week for folks. This is going to be at this, you know, the announcement yesterday is going to hit Edmontonians hard again. And so I think we just need to move those chairs and we need to put them on the front lawn and we need to say hi to people as they walk by. You know, it, we just need to encourage that street presence in so many ways. So, yeah, and then and then build the social, but just first step, <laughs> get to know people, say hi. I like your idea. That's a great <laughs> idea. You might I, I like that something. You know, it, it looks like it, it's a nicer day. We can all uh, pull a chair out and sit out front if we don't have sit a front, front porch or sit on your balcony if you're in a if you have one in a condo or apartment or Absolutely. I guess sit out front and. Uh, and then we, uh, yeah, what we have a party to party on our block to look forward to. We all need things to look forward to. So I Absolutely. think both of those are great suggestions. Uh, Laura and Howard, we're so grateful for your time and contributions. And thank you to everybody who participated and attended today. And have a have a great rest of your day and uh, be kind to one another. It's mental health yeah. week and we all need to take care of ourselves first and each other as well. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Alex. It's been a pleasure. I would love to see everyone's face here today, but I hope everyone um, yeah, has a wonderful rest of your week. Take care of yourselves. Thanks. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.